Welcome back to the Morning Show here at Arise News. Uh, yesterday, 30th of July, was World Day Against Trafficking in Persons. It's a global problem that needs a global solution. Indeed, hence the day set aside annually by the United Nations to raise awareness, encourage vigilance and gain support for prevention of human trafficking and modern day slavery. Human trafficking and modern day slavery is a crime that exploits women, children and men for numerous purposes, including forced labor or sex. Thus, every country in the world is affected by human trafficking, whether the country of origin, transit or destination for victims. Well, joining us now is Eni Tong, Ibironke, a lawyer, trained journalist, migration expert, and social sector advocate to discuss the topic, human trafficking and modern-day slavery. Welcome, Eni Tong, to the show. Thank you very much. Now, with all the publicity we have seen or we have had in recent times, I mean, deaths in the Mediterranean, um, Nigerians trapped in Libya, we still see that a lot of people are being trafficked. Yeah. Is it that the awareness is not enough or the push factors that lead people to being trafficked is just too compelling? Fantastic. You see, you've raised two very valid points. First, we have the issue of the awareness really not being enough. You find that a lot of the awareness that you find on the media, the media social media, or even amongst people is very low. So what you're finding in terms of awareness is people who are telling themselves, their neighbors, their friends, that if we can get to Europe, we can make a better life. Once we can leave Nigeria. And that leads to the second part, which is the push factors. And primarily, the major push factor for Nigeria is economic. Hmm. You find that people will tell you that we can feed, we don't have jobs, roads are bad, there's no infrastructure, standard of living is, bad, is poor. And so the myriad of issues are enormous. They're all over. And really, so while that... While it may be clear that we can see the narrative as per the destination country policies or we can see what happens in transit, people tell you that, people tell you to your face, I'd rather die in the Mediterranean and stay in Nigeria. But we talk about these push factors. We know these problems are there. But we have seen people that their lives are not inundated by these push factors, but they just have a mindset that... The words of somebody, not my word. Mm -hmm. If I not go Babylon, that's overseas. <laughs> I not go make them. I will not be able to do anything if I don't go overseas. The mindset is just there. That's absolutely true. But then you find that you those people, in that case, that's a paradigm shift that is required. But what happens is that people see, no matter what it is that they're seeing in Nigeria, the image imagery of life abroad, especially propagated by the media through Nollywood. And other factors, what we see mm. on, in the films, in the movies, what we see shows a, an utopia, a place that is really fantastic, a place where life is easy. All you need to do is go there and pick up money from the streets, like people think of Lagos. So while they may not necessarily seemingly have those push factors that we claim are economic or otherwise, there's that element of, I just want a better life. And I want it at all costs. And like you said, if I don't go Babylon, mm. I will not be happy. But then the reality is that... Over a period of time, because of that mindset that a lot of them have, you find that their situations actually begin to de degenerate. So you have somebody who's working very well, who had a good job or a fairly decent job, suddenly loses his job and thinks to himself that the only way out is to go. But of course, like I, we say every time, how do you go? What are you going to do? What value are you adding to the system? How do you prevent yourself from falling into the arms of those that would tell you stories that suit what you want to hear, that will get you to Babylon at all costs. But middle-class people are even taking the plunge in this country. I mean, I had somebody that was two, three levels, and if he had worked hard in four years' time, or five years' time, he could have been the MD of that company. And he took the plunge, mm. and he did the exams, and voila, Canada, everything he had worked for, ready to leave it. Oh, the life is better to start from <laughs> square one. Because what they don't tell them is mm. you go to start from even square zero all over again in Canada. You see, unfortunately, the mental state of a lot of Nigerians is really, really bad right now. So you find that when you're looking at behavioral change campaigns, which is one of what we're doing right now, you have to understand that what is it that is going on in the minds of those people. You're saying in four years' time, he could have become the MD of where he was. But then he's asking himself, and asking you that when I become the MD, what is the quality of my life? Now, this is, you know, we need to understand what pushes people. 
And he thinks himself, even if I become the MD of this organization in four years' time, one, it's a gamble. I do a few, ex I mean, I have to walk through. What if the company doesn't survive, even though it may have been unlikely in this case? What if in those, in those four years, somebody else comes in and takes over? Then the question that pushes a lot of people that are even going to Canada and that are even going the route of doing exams and studying are things like, what about my children? For a lot of middle-class people, what is driving the move for migration right now is their children. Sustainability of life for the next generation. But then, you see, middle-class people, that's a good case. What about those people who are not middle-class or, or who are maybe just graduates or not educated and that decide that I am going to make sure that I push myself out of Nigeria? Now, that brings us to another case entirely. And we find that research has shown over a period of time that a particular area of Nigeria have has the highest number of illegal migrants, or migrants generally, both illegal and regular. And you find that what is happening there is societal pressure, family pressures. So you leave people who say, even those people who are going to Canada, say, okay, I, have the, I can write, I can read, I can push. But they say, look, you go around, every family in a part of Nigeria has somebody abroad. Every single family. So that's a culture. It's a culture. So you have, there, there's nothing wrong in migrating. But no, there's nothing We're talking wrong. about people who end up now being trafficked and sold to slavery. Now you see, trafficking comes in various forms. Mm -hmm. You have trafficking that is by force, you have trafficking that is by coercion. Now for a lot of people that are migrating, you find that most times it's stories, the narrative they're told. Oh, you know what? You are a very pretty girl. Mm -hmm. Before you know what's happening, I can get you a job, you can become a model. You're tall, you're beautiful. And then she thinks, oh, OK, I can become the next Oluchi mm. or the next. You know, they tell the stories that are so real. You can become the next Naomi Campbell or something really good. What about the situations where they're looking and saying to you, you don't have any, you don't have any education at all? All you have is your school set. But you can become a hairdresser. You're good with your hands. Learn a craft. And so the stories, that is where it happens. But then what happens next is you find that most of these people are not eligible to actually get proper visas or they, they don't have the right qualifications and the right tools. So that is where the issue of trafficking then comes in. Because irregular migration in itself is a methodology. Mm. It's not, it is simply saying, you can say illegal migration, so that you're going without your papers being correct or you're forging your documents. But how are you going, which is where human trafficking really plays out. That becomes the action. So they're taking you across on dingy boats, mm -hmm. they're taking you through the desert, but the story is never told the way it is. I said, well, you know one reason? Human trafficking has been said, according to research, to be a, a $150 billion industry. Because you're looking at people for first labor, sexual exploitation, commercial reasons, mm. there isn't there for all sorts of things. So we see these voyagers who have left, some of them desperately, and find themselves in these dire conditions, only realizing that there's no place like home. Mm. And some of them are able to come back mm -hmm. uh, with the collaboration from the uh, EOM and the federal government from Libya. We're still yes. seeing them returning. My question to you from what you've just said now is um, how much of an, of an obstacle do people like that have when it comes to um, assessing assistance when they're back, protection, redress, and justice? Well, in this case, what's been going on is you find that the major organization that has been spearheading any form of assistance and redress for returnees is IOM, the International Organization the for IOM. Migration. Mm -hmm. Now, what then, what then happens is that when they're back, the first place where they face any challenges from what we've done so far so good and what we've seen, because we, we actually look at creating awareness pre-going. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at potential migrants. But we're also realizing that in looking at potential migrants, you have a lot of returnees, and then the question you have asked has come up. So what they find is they're able to somehow, the only integration they get so far so good is some sort of aid to set up a business. Now, the Edo state government has also taken that up as a task. You find that a lot of work is going on. What happens, you find a few government agencies, NAPTIP, you find UNHCR, RUM, and Edo state government are all working hand in hand. But you find that a lot of people don't even come out to tell you I'm a returning. Because the major reason, and that's a problem that we're facing in this part of the world, of the world at all, in Nigeria, is stigmatization. You don't want to be told, you don't want to tell people that I failed in trying to get abroad. You say, going abroad, that abroad mm. is the destination. That's the Babylon. Mm. Then you didn't get to the Babylon. Mm. Your family will kill you. Why? Why is your head different? Why is your head different? Mm. Why would you be, why would we send you? Because sometimes you find that it's family funds, community money. 
and we actually get you to go there so I because can make they do pay for these trips. They pay mm. for the trips. Can't, they pay. can't the money be used to start up a business? Be the so question shouldn't that is, be the new consciousness? The question is, if I start up a business, what is the sustainability of that business? Then secondly, how much income will I generate from that business? As opposed to living a life where in the abroad, because it's called the abroad, mm -hmm. where everything is going well. So you Which find is a myth. It's a myth. But then they see people come back in December. We're going to the end of the year very soon. I'm going to find all the people coming back. And then they're going to be spending foreign currency. I just got back. I up. just got back. Mm. And they're going to make you feel really bad. Mm. And then you're going to have family members. So you see that person's child has gone abroad. What's happening to you? But nobody tells them that this is what goes on. This is how the journey is. Mm -hmm. This is what the reality is. That policies have changed. One of the things that people don't realize is that, yes, in the 80s and the 90s, you could actually succeed crossing through. But policies, destination country policies have changed. Now, before you can, you can't cross the Mediterranean, because even the Libyan Coast Guards have been told to make sure that people don't cross onto this thing. You can't cross. So you find that a lot of things are different. Now, the media needs to do a lot more mm. in letting people know that these are the real issues. Not the whitewashing or the quoting that we're just saying about, about talking about, oh, yes, what well, I push factors is good. Mm. But if enough people knew that they would not be able to cross that easily and that they would die, if you look at it every year, over 5,000 people. Die. 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 die, die, I think they you should die. say that again, because somebody's watching out there. Over and the pro pro 5,000 people die. Mm. You see, they, I mean, no, you find that the number of people that are getting to cross, when, even when you do get to cross into your destination country, so from Libya, I finally cross into Italy, your chances of you actually being able to get out of the detention camps are out. Because they if, you manage, if you get them, you don't have any papers. You don't have any documentation. So the detention comes waiting. And now the policies are even getting more stringent when they send you right back to Libya. And they are stuck in Libya. You're stuck in Libya. I'm not just stuck in Libya. Because people tell you, I don't mind being stuck in Libya. Mm. It can't be worse than living in Nigeria. Mm. We're not just stuck in Libya. You're then sold into all forms of slavery. Mm. Now, people say, OK, what is it? Wouldn't they be paying me some money? But imagine if you're a woman. And 71% of people that are trafficked and that go through that are women and children. Mm. Now, you're talking about for sexual exploitation. We're talking about work in work, work under if under really horrible conditions. Mm. We're talking about no payment, no wages being paid for the work you're actually no doing. No workers' right of no any sort. Workers' right. You're talking about workers' right. No workers', workers right, right is carrying it for. We'll, we'll go on a quick break. We'll come back and we'll talk about some other new phenomenon that is happening now. We'll be right back after this. A quick commercial time. Welcome back to the last laugh of the show. <laughs> you're watching the Money Show here on the Rise News. And we still have Anita Ibirunke um, talking about um, um, forced human trafficking and modern day slavery, actually. You were talking about, you, you mentioned the statistics about 71 to 72% 71 of, of those trafficked, trafficked people are women, women and children. children. What is responsible for that? What, you know, makes women and girls so vulnerable to trafficking? So the first thing is, first and foremost, the very first reason is because they're the vulnerable, they're vulnerable part of the society. Women naturally would think of ways to provide succor for their family members, and they're the ones that are most likely going to believe those stories. And when you think about it, they think, okay, I'm a woman, I have things I can do. Mm -hmm. So I'm the one who's going to learn a trade, I'm the one who can make hair, I'm the one who can actually go back to school, I'm the one that... And so when you find that in that situation, now for the children, Children are usually victims. They're just victims who are innocent. They get carried along in the whole, in the whole shebang. And for them, most times, you might find that it's forced. They're kidnapped, or they're not even aware of happening. Or their parents believe that, I'm trying to give my child some leverage in life. And so a trusted person tells them that I know somebody who knows somebody who can help your child go to school. You find that scholarships are usually the things that are told to them. Children, and most of the age is about 15. And I say, okay, you know what, this child can go to school, your child is intelligent, or your child, by the time your child is a big child, you'll think this child is 18, we can make, give your child papers for an 18-year-old. And that's why they end up being the ones. But then again, what also happens is because women are easy tools for sexual exploitation, let's face mm -hmm. it. So really, really, and that is a huge market. It's a billion-dollar industry. But you know, trafficking itself, is a, it's already, so its statistics go into billions of dollars. And you're looking and saying, okay, so I can bring one woman, two women, why not more? And what also happens is that along the journey, a lot of women get pregnant. So it's like you're bringing more victims mm. along the line. And those are the reasons why you find women and children being the most vulnerable, which is 
one of the reasons why there needs to be that awareness, talking to women and letting them know that if you like coming to tell you that this is what you can do, look, you have a brain, you can use it, and you can actually create access to economic empowerment for yourself. If you want to leave your country, ask the right questions. Find out what value you're going to bring to the table. Be your, you find some women will tell you that, I know we're going to be, we're, we're one of the conferences we had, and the women said, I know we're going to be sold, uh, we're going to be used for prostitution, and we don't mind. Why did she change her mind? The agent that was going to take the herself and her friend raped the friend when she went to go and collect her papers. And so they tell you, and the question became, you would rather not be raped in your country, but you'd rather be sold for slavery, to sex, for slavery as a, sex, as a prostitute. And so that question, that goes to the question of how are we as women thinking? Okay. So I've been trying to dig out a message. I, I couldn't get it here on my phone, but it was a message somebody sent me many months ago about a new trend now in town. In fact, it's been advertised on media, on radio. They tell you that there's a work opportunity mm. in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait. Live and work. Yeah, live and work in Saudi mm. Arabia, in Kuwait, in Korea. They say you're going to do factory work in Dubai. Yes. And it gets into a trafficking case. Yes. She, the message she sent me was, Saudi Arabia, she went to Saudi Arabia, turns out that it was a trafficking case. What happened next? The agent that took them there told her that she should call her family here and they should send him, I think, over 500,000 higher. That's why I was trying to dig out That's the it. message yes. Yes, and mm -hmm. held the lady, kidnapped the lady, mm -hmm. but held out to ransom. Hostage. Or held out to held out hostage. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was when the money was released that the lady was let go. After a lot of, she probably didn't tell you all she went through within that period of time. But the funny thing is, adverts for this are going on on local radio. The truth is that, you say that that's why that is really the reality of it. The level of desperation and poverty in the minds of the people. I use the word in the minds very loosely because yes, there, there is poverty. There's a lot of desperation. But then the question becomes. When they say, back then, we used to say it and we used to laugh about it, that if you want to keep a secret, hide it in a book. A secret from a black man, hide it in a book. Now, a lot, a lot of people are not willing to research and find out or verify facts about what they see. So I see it in the media, I believe it's true. Which is why we're now beginning to say, I mean, my, I, work, I do a lot of work with the media. I say to the media people, what awareness are we creating, really, about what the realities and truths are? Now, one of the things that's come out of this is that there's a few organizations are beginning to look at ethical recruitment because there are job vacancies in all those places, and those recruitments are real. But what's happening is that the unreal ones, the false ones, the fake ones, are, be, are now becoming far more than the real ones because people are not going to do their homework well. They, all they want is, I just want to go out there. So the question then becomes, this person in particular is a victim like many other victims, and that's a new form of human trafficking that has been done because what do people want? It means, so you find that people want a means to work, a means of livelihood, something they can use to eat and earn and take care of their families. So media people, we have a lot of but work to do. But they're holding them hostage. Well, the, two quick questions, but um, first, yesterday was the day set aside by the United Nations to draw awareness to yes, yes. things like this. Um, in a country like Nigeria, what's the message? What should we do? What should we have been doing yesterday, today, <sighs> tomorrow? Mm. Mm. Now, what we should have been doing yesterday and today and tomorrow is it's a call to government agencies. It's a call, actually, it's a call. The day is an awareness to governments. Uh, what are you doing to prevent the scourge of human trafficking? Because human trafficking is being pushed by other factors, mm -hmm. primarily economic. So what is it that the organizations that work with governments can do? How can you make your environment more conducive for citizens? How can you create access to economic empowerment? Which is why you have a lot of a few initiatives that have come up in recent times that have been considered as alternatives, so to speak, to human trafficking or irregular migration. So if people can have a means of livelihood, or they can have a means to be able to work or get certifications or get properly certified, migration in itself is a human right. And we always make it clear that it's a fundamental human right. The freedom to move from place to place is a fundamental human right. But your right stops where the country, destination country's right starts. So how do you come into my country? Mm -hmm. And those are the things that we're looking at. That. So please, you can migrate as you want, legally and regularly. But then in terms of World Day Against Human Trafficking mm -hmm. and Modern Day Slavery, is that create this raise awareness about the plight of the people 
call to, call to action for governments to create enabling environments and policies that will uh, make sure that their citizens are able to work freely and to also create protection facilities and agencies that will protect people, where you have agencies like NAPTIP. Mm. And you have other, you know. So by the end of the day, no matter what the United Nations does or what agencies do, there's, that, there's still the responsibility of the people themselves to actually question, to ask, to find ways. Because, like, people are able to say, I'm going to write the exams. It takes a lot of hard work to actually mm. migrate properly to another country. Mm. Now, half of people don't want to do that hard work, unfortunately. While some other have tell you that they've tried and it's not working. So at the end of the day, Nigeria is a beautiful country. And it may very well be that we should look at how, with our vast landmass, yes. how we can actually, industries, organizations, you know, in not, there's agriculture, there's manufacturing. Mm. There's so many things that can be done. Just driving down Lagos, Ibadan Express, where you see the vast landmass is just un mm. uninhabited. Mm. Nothing is being done. Mm. And very quickly, my second question, uh, because you, you talked about prevention. Uh, and, you know, they say prevention is better and cheaper than, than cure. And so in curbing human trafficking, let's talk about the role of agencies, um, collaboration. Yes. Do you think that there's enough collaboration between agencies in Nigeria to curb it? And what should they be doing differently? I would say that the collaboration is ongoing. It's probably not as much as it should be here because... It's only in recent times. Even the World Day Against Human Trafficking was just declared in 2013 by United Nations. And that's just about, that's five years ago, this is 2019. So that's give or take about six, six years six, ago. Because, because I remember the World Cup in Russia, mm. Nigerians <laughs> were trafficked, and they were trafficked through the airports. Yes. NAPTIP did raise alarm before they traveled for the, for the World Thank Cup in Russia. And it was an embarrassing situation for the country. See? Uh, over 100 Nigerians were trapped in, in Russia because the traveling agencies mm. canceled their That's return it. tickets. That's but they did travel through the airports. That's it. So is there enough interagency collaboration? I mean, NAPTIP raised that alarm, but it still happened. Because now, you see, that, that, that's the truth. Because at the end of the day, human trafficking is a security challenge. So that, that would be, the next thing would be, one of the reasons why the day was created, to create awareness, start security issues and collaboration. So one of the things we would say is, there needs to be more interagency collaboration. There needs to be a social sector in, uh, really collaboration with government agencies. Because you find that enough people, all that has been done so far, is advocacy, awareness. But then you would need manpower to say, how do we bring traffickers to book? To date, you find that traffickers and agents are not, it's not really a crime yet. If you find that it's a crime, yes, but how do you identify them? Punitive you, measures. Thank mm. you, punitive measures. So you find the people that are being punished most times are the victims. So mm. you are trafficked for drug trafficking, you are trafficked and you are being made to push drugs, you are the one that is punished. Mm. But the person who actually pushed you or trafficked you or set you up is not punished. I, I mean, that's a conversation we'll like to have, the ecosystem of trafficking. Mm. Maybe some other day when you come. That's about our show for you today. It's been a great Thank one. Thank you so much, Anita, you. for being on the show. Thank I'm Ade Sua, Omar Ron. And I'm Rufa Yosini. Goodbye. Thank you.